so we look at an image now, right? Right. Well, we, we David mentioned earlier quilt making uh, as one of the sort of activities that was communal, communally done. It was one of really the only activities permitted to women that took them uh, out of their home, perhaps into another home. Uh, and it was with quilting that you do see uh, traditions that are formed and then passed down generation to generation. And it's with quilting that you also see these sort of invisible networks of, of sisterhood and kinship that aren't necessarily evident in traditional archives. So I wanted to show you an example from our collection, which is actually now on view in an exhibition, Every Path Laid Open, Women of Concord and the Quest for Equality. This is a friendship quilt, also known as a signature quilt. Uh, and this was worked in 1840 on the occasion of Rebecca Brooks's marriage uh, to an Acton farmer. So 96 of Rebecca's friends got together and each of them signed their name to a quilt square, which when brought together formed this quilt. Uh, and you can see each individual name on these squares. Uh, one of the features you can notice in that detail shot is the use of printed cotton, uh, which was readily available in Concord by the early to mid 19th century, thanks to advances in industrial textile production on both sides of the Atlantic. So we're going to take a, uh, take a look at the varieties in these textiles here, and that's, uh, these are all, uh, these are all, uh, textiles woven for, for uh, clothing, uh, you can see there's a great deal of variety, fashion counts, uh, and there's a lot of variety there. So we'll take a look at, in a little more detail at one of these, uh, you know, Merrimack Valley or Lowell uh, print cottons. I'm just holding up a, a doll's uh, quilt to show the shape that we saw in that signature quilt on the wall uh, that the tail uh, is because this is going on a four-posted uh, bed, and uh, and the tail has to go uh, has to go through there. Um, but we want to take a look at uh, at some of the textiles that are involved here. This uh, sort of mossy-looking stuff is you see that uh, in uh, uh, in a lot of. Uh, uh, you see it or, or, or something or motif like it in a lot of uh, Lowell textiles. And then this other uh, kind of modern looking interesting uh, uh, motif there, we saw something else like it, perfectly abstract, uh, but that was, that was, it sold a few bolts of cloth. And, uh, uh, and again, but this is print, this is not done with the loom, this is much, much less expensive uh, to, uh, to produce to produce the textiles this way. Uh, but it is also the case that, uh, uh, as Ralph Waldo Emerson points out, that, uh, that the cotton thread ties uh, the South to the North, literally. Uh, so that cotton is all produced by slave labor in the South, uh, and the, uh, uh, the very act of, of uh, Quilt making uh, becomes politicized when when you are making quilts for sale at, uh, at at fundraisers for abolitionist activities, and it is not lost on the participants that they are still using cotton to uh, uh, to make these things. So we'll wind uh, this program down with uh, three more examples just to show different techniques and uh, some really interesting um, objects from our collection. Uh, we usually like to end on a little highlight, so we'll work our way to that, starting with uh, an example of white work. Um, and this, this is, uh, th this is uh, not actually a pocket, it's almost in the same shape, but this is, this is a little uh, later. This, this is a purse uh, carried outside uh, of the clothing, uh, and it's, it's worked by, we can take a look at the detail here, uh, worked in, in cotton, uh, worked in Concord, Mary Hosmer in 1808. Uh, and this is, this is white work. There are no, uh, there are no colored threads, uh, used in this, but in, in this instance, I think what we're seeing is that, uh, you, you 
separate out an area with a, a buttonhole stitch or something like this is surrounded with, with a satin stitch, uh, and then you pick out uh, every other warp thread or something like that, and then, and then bundle them together to get this netting effect. Uh, rather, it's, it's, it's not unlike uh, the stitches you would use for repairs. It's, it's almost exactly the same thing, but here it's done for a decorative, uh, for a decorative effect, and then uh, satin stitches used to puff up uh, the floral motifs uh, that, that are wandering around this piece. And here's, the, uh, uh, here's the central motif of an urn uh, with, a, with a flower. Urns pop up a lot after 1800. It's sort of a very uh, neoclassical motif. Uh, you often see in, in samplers and in embroidery these sort of neoclassical motifs, the weeping willow, the urn, all of which sort of emerged uh, after George Washington's death as sort of this sort of national mourning uh, imagery, uh, but then continued on as just sort of popular symbols. So you, if you find an urn, you can usually use that to date what you're looking at to after 1790 and on. Although it is the case that for textiles in particular, urns almost identical to what we saw in 188, you could find on a piece of 168. So uh, there, there are uh, um, not particularly hard and fast rules, but there is a series there, a sequence there, but which by looking at museum collections and publications, you could figure out what that series is. But there are also some outliers, so we're going to end with a couple of outliers here. Uh, and this is a this is a wonderful example. Sure looks like embroidery, uh, but why don't we take a closer look at this? When was she working? 1770s. Yeah. Um, this is actually uh, imitation um, embroidery. We saw that that. Uh, we saw weaving imitated by embroidery. Here we're seeing embroidery imitated by printing. Uh, so this is done with, with a block, with a carved block, uh, and we can see two or three different colors here and several different blocks uh, used to put this together. Uh, so in this case, this is the work of a, of a woman who did this as a profession. She worked in Lexington in the 1770s, uh, and uh, this, the form we're looking at is a pocket, uh, again, worn under the apron, outside the gown. Uh, and uh, a woman would work up a thing like this, and then when the uh, itinerant stamper, that's, that's the job, stamping, uh, comes by, maybe you've got a few of these pieces and you get them stamped and you pay your, uh, you pay your money and it's done and you don't have to embroider it. Although, as I said, uh, embroidering in colored threads was actually a, a, a welcome pastime. Uh, but here is a, here is a, a really interesting uh, variant on all that. Um, and, and then we're, gonna, we're going to wrap up with a, with a, a really very unusual piece. Um, we have been, we've been talking really all along about how utilitarian uh, sewing can be. We've seen a few examples of fancy work that, uh, that you get to continue after you're through with your schooling, but just not all that often. Uh, but there is one uh, individual who is, is quite a, a standout for the uh, uh, for continuing this uh, what, into her married life and beyond, uh, and, uh, but also someone who had a particular level uh, of ability and, and stuck with it. So this is Mary Wright Alsop, uh, and we're going to take a, uh, take a closer look at, uh, uh, at the purse that uh, that she made. So there are a number of things that survive from, from Mary Alsop, and many of those that survive, it's clear, were made for members of the family. So here's, here's a piece that was made for a member of, uh, of Mary's family. When uh, Mary, she is proud to tell us, was 73 years old. Uh, and uh, so Mary Wright is, Mary Alsop is working in, uh, in uh, Connecticut. Uh, and this piece is dated 1812, somewhere it's dated, uh, 1813, Here, here's the date. Uh, and uh, 
It is extraordinary work. Uh, it's not embroidery, this is knit. Uh, and I think it must have been knit with a needle almost as fine as a sewing needle. It's just amazing. And there are bands and bands of different motifs. Everything imaginable is in here, and all done uh, with, with uh, knitting. And uh, I would venture to say none of it done with a pattern. So these are all uh, mental patterns that are that are being transferred into this silk, uh, into this silk thread for this really e extraordinary piece. Thank you for coming and joining us today. We have one more course left next week, same time, uh, and we will be looking at works on paper. So I hope you can join us then, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for coming. Bye bye.